All right, welcome back. Starting today our discussion of the joints. By definition, a joint or an articulation is a site where two or more bones are gonna be meeting. This will allow the skeleton mobility as well as it allows you to hold your skeleton together. It allows me to attach the bones together as well as allowing movement to take place. We classify the joints according to two major factors. First one, according to the movement allowed, the amount of movement that is allowed by the joint. All right. So first type is going to be thin arthrosis, and those are immovable joints. They are thin arthrotic joints. Second one are amphi arthrosis, and those are slightly movable joints. And diarthrosis, those are freely movable joints. The second way by which we classify the joints is going to be according to the material binding the bones together. What is holding those bones together? If I did have fibrous connective tissue, we classify those joints as fibrous joints. If I do have cartilage that attaches the bones together, we classify them as cartilaginous joints, and if I have a space that is filled by a fluid, between the articulating bones, we call this fluid is my synovial fluid, and the joints here are classified as synovial joints. So again, again, how do we classify the different joints according to two major factors according to the degree of movement they allow we classify as thin arthrosis they are immovable amphi arthrosis they are slightly movable joints or diarthrosis or diarthrotic joints, those are freely movable. According to the material binding the bones together, we classify those as either fibrous, cartilaginous, or synovial joints. All right, so let's start first with the fibrous joints. First type of fibrous joints, this is gonna be the sutures. What do you think? Are the sutures fibrous, cartilaginous, or synovial? What is attaching those cranial bones together? Do you have cartilage in between? No, you, are, you have short connective tissue fibers that are attaching or fusing the bones together. So this is gonna be classified as a fibrous joint. Do you have any movement between your frontal bone and the parietal bones, between the parietal bones and the temporal bone, between the parietal and the occipital bone, is there any movement taking place between those cranial bones? No. So what would you classify them? Thin arthrosis, amphi arthrosis, or diarthrosis? Which one do you pick? Again, reminder, thin arthrosis are immovable, amphi arthrosis, they are slightly immovable, and diarthrosis, they are freely movable. So which one? would you classify the sutures as? Thin arthrosis, amphi arthrosis, or diarthrosis? 
Zen arthrosis, exactly. Zen arthrosis. All right, looking at another type of joints. Those are called syndesmosis. And in a syndesmosis joint, I have ligament attaching the bones together. Like the ligament attaching my tibia to the fibula. So here, what would you classify this joint as? Is this fibrous, cartilaginous, or synovial? If you remember, what kind of tissue do you have forming your ligaments? Do you remember? What's the type of tissue that forms the tendons and ligaments? And that's why when you go to the gym, you're going to be training your biceps like this and not like this because it tolerates only tension in one direction. Do you remember what kind of of tissue did we have forming the tendons and ligaments? It's dense regular connective tissue, exactly. So I have dense regular connective tissue, I have connective tissue attaching the bones together. So what do we classify those joints as? They are fibrous joints. So syndesmoses are fibrous joints. I'm attaching the bones by ligaments. And how about the degree of mobility they allow? Do you have any movement between your tibia and fibula? Is there any movement? Can you move the tibia against the fibula? No. So what do you classify those as? Synarthrosis, amphiarthrosis, or diarthrosis? What do you think? Synarthrosis, exactly. So they are classified as synarthrotic joints. Synarthrosis. So syndesmoses are fibrous and synarthrotic joints. Another type of joints that we're looking at today is going to be the joint between your teeth and the sockets, either in the mandible or the maxillary bone your teeth and the sockets in the mandible of the mandible or the maxillary bone are going to be attached together by a special type of ligaments we call this is by periodontal ligament what makes it different from the previous ligament is that it has blood vessels large blood vessels it has a lot of nerve fibers traveling through it so it's not like any other ligament. So we give it a special name. It's called the periodontal ligament. And when I say ligament, what comes to your mind? What kind of tissue again? Connective tissue. So I'm attaching the two bones with connective tissue. So what would you classify the gomphoses as? Gomphosis is the joint between the teeth and the sockets of your mandible and the, uh, or the sockets of the maxillary bone. So what would you classify the joint as? Fibrous, cartilaginous, or synovial? If you're attaching the bones with ligament, that special type of ligament called the periodontal ligament. So it's going to be classified as a fibrous joint. So exactly. So here we're looking at gomphosis. It's a fibrous joint. And is there any movement between your teeth and the mandible and, or your teeth and the maxillary bone? Is there any movement that is taking place? What do you think? Is there any movement? No. If you do have any movement, this means you need to check a dentist. All right. If you have any movement between your teeth and the sockets here in the mandible or the maxillary bones, this means you need to check with the dentist. All right, so this means what? This means I have no movement. So what would you classify the gomphosis as? 
is it going to be sin arthrosis, amphi arthrosis, or diarthrosis? Exactly, sin arthrosis. They are thin arthrotic joints. Looking here at the joints in which I'm attaching the bones with hyaline cartilage. Those are called synchondroses. Synchondroses. Excuse me. So chondro, chondro means cartilage. So actually the name here tells you everything that you need to know about the joint and its classification. So chondro means cartilage. So what would you classify this joint as? Fibrous, cartilaginous, or synovial? What do you think? What would I classify synchondrosis as? Cartilaginous, fibrous, or synovial? So I'm telling you that the bones are attached with highly cartilage, so they are classified as cartilaginous joints. Like what synchondrosis do I have? Like the attachments between my ribs and the sternum. So I have coastal cartilages, and if you remember, the coastal cartilages are formed of highly cartilage. So is there any movement between my ribs and the sternum, my chest? Is there any movement between the ribs and the sternum? No, they are fused together with cartilage. So they go up, down, together. But they don't move along one another. So another example also of a synchondrosis, if you remember, in your lung bones, you did have a primary ossification center in your shaft of the lung bone and a secondary ossification center in the epiphysis. And remember, you didn't ossify all the, cart all the cartilage. You left the epiphyseal plate, which is formed of highly cartilage. So here, I have two bones which are attached to one another with hyaline cartilage, the epiphyseal plate. So we're gonna consider here the attachment between the epiphysis and the shaft. It's a synchondrosis. Is there any movement when you were a child? Was there any movement between the epiphysis and the diaphysis of your lung bones. Was there any movement? No, it's a synarthrosis. That's why, that's why people would say, yeah, children have more bones than adults. Why is, do they have more bones? Because this is considered a bone, this is considered another bone, in a child, but when they fuse together, it's just the humerus, it's just one bone. So earlier in life, you did have more bones. The number of bones is, is higher as a child because simply the bones, as you get older, will, will fuse together. All right, does this make sense? All right, so look at on here for the symphysis. What's a symphysis? A symphysis is a type of joints where you're gonna be attaching the bones together with fibrocartilage. Like where? Like the intervertebral discs between the vertebrae I have the intervertebral discs which are formed of fibrocartilage attaching the vertebrae together. 
also the pubic symphysis. The pubic symphysis is formed of fibrocartilage attaching the two pubic bones together. Is there any movement of the spine? What do you think? So, symphysis, is it first a cartilaginous, fibrous, or synovial? What do you think? If I'm telling you that the symphysis is a joint between two bones which are attached with fibrocartilage, so what class of joints do you, do you say it is? Is it fibrous, cartilaginous, or synovial? It's cartilaginous, exactly. So symphysis here is a cartilaginous joint. And do you have any movements that is taking place between the two pubic bones or between the vertebrae of your spine? Is there any movement? that is taking place. Yeah, there is a slight movement taking place. So what would you classify this joint as, this symphysis as? Is this synarthrosis, amphiarthrosis, or diarthrosis? If there is a slight movement taking place. If a slight movement, what would you classify the symphysis as? It's an amphi arthros amphi arthros exactly so again again what did we mention so far we have two main characteristics according to which we're going to be classifying the joints first according to the degree of mobility of the joint classify the joint into either syn arthrosis amphiarthrosis or diarthrosis and according to the material binding the two articulating bones if it was fibrous tissue it's going to be a fibrous joint if it was a cartilage attaching the bones together it's a cartilaginous joint if i did have a shallow space filled with synovial fluid we call those are my synovial joints so we studied five types here of joints those are three fibrous joints which are the sutures syndesmosis in which i'm attaching the bones with a ligament gomphosis remember gomphosis gum 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 so gomphos gomphosis think of gums remember those are the joints between your teeth and the sockets of the mandible and the maxillary bone. Synchondrosis, I'm attaching the bones with hyaline cartilage. Symphysis, I'm attaching the bones with fibrocartilage. All of them, sutures, syndesmosis, gomphosis, and Synchondrosis, all of them are synarthrotic joints. They are immovable. The symphysis, where you're going to be attaching the bones with fibrocartilage, this is going to be amphiarthrosis. It's slightly moving, it allows slight movement to take place. All right, so for the first in class, for the first question of the in class activity for today, so what type of joints do we have between the bones in the cranium? What kind of joints do we have between the cranial bones? Are those sutures, gonfosis, syndesmosis, synchondrosis? Which one? A, exactly, sutures. Can you remind me of the names of the four sutures that we need to know for the upcoming lab exam? Do you remember what are the four sutures that we have discussed? 
Remember, what was the name of the suture between the frontal bone and the two parietal bones? That looks like a crown. What do we call the suture? Exactly, coronal suture. And you remember the one that will be attaching the two parietal bones together, traveling in the midline? Sagittal. And you remember the one here that will be attaching the temporal bone anteriorly to the sphenoid, superiorly to the parietal, and posteriorly to the occipital bone. This is my squamous suture. And do you remember the ones that will be attaching the occipital bone to the parietal bones? Lamboid suture, exactly. All right, so again, again, now you know the type of joints between the cranial bones. This is what we call the sutures. And those are fibrous joints. They are synarthrosis. Moving on to our third class of joints. This is going to be the synovial joints. And the synovial joints are going to share common characteristics. So the first important characteristics that we can see on here is that the joints articulating bones going to be separated by a very shallow space. We call this space is my joint cavity. And if I have a cavity, and this cavity is going to be filled with fluid called the synovial fluid, I need something to retain this fluid inside the cavity, right? So I will have a joint capsule. So looking at the synovial joints, first important characteristics that we can see is that the articular surfaces are covered with cartilage. So the bones are not directly articulating on top of one another, but each of those bones is gonna be covered or their articular surface surfaces are going to be covered with cartilage of hyaline type. So I've got hyaline cartilage. That would be covering those articular surfaces. Why is it so important to have hyaline cartilage? What do you think? Reduce friction. But I might have like smooth surface of a bone. Why would I need cartilage? What is the characteristic, a major characteristic that differentiates cartilage from bone? Like when we study the tissue, we mentioned that the cartilage 
doesn't have what that exists in the ball. It doesn't have, if you remember, blood vessels. It was avascular. Think of it. If you kept rubbing your skin over and over and over all day long, what's going to happen to your skin after a few hours? Bleed before it bleeds, peeling. Will it get inflamed or not? Yes. All right, so think of your joints this way. So your joints are under constant irritation. Every time you move, there is friction between the articular surfaces of your bones. And inflammation is simply a dilation of the vessels. So the vessels are dilated, this causes the inflammation. So I need something that doesn't have blood vessels to not get inflamed because I am exposing those surfaces all the time to irritation. So articular surfaces gonna be for covered with highly in cartilage in order to prevent inflammation of those surfaces with recurrent irritation, recurrent friction. Another major characteristic on here is that we've seen for the synovial joints that I have a small potential space. We call this small potential space. It's my joint cavity. And surrounding this joint cavity, we're gonna have a joint capsule. The joint capsule is actually formed of two layers. It has an outer part. This is called my fibrous capsule. And if you remember the fibrous capsule of the joints, this is the location of the dense irregular connective tissue, if you remember. The inside of the fibrous capsule did have a membrane. And this membrane is the one that is gonna be responsible to extract the synovial fluid from the blood. We call this is my synovial membrane. And the synovial membrane is gonna be filling this potential space, the shallow space between the articulating bones with synovial fluid. What do you think is the function of the synovial fluid? Why would I have fluid between those articulating bones like this? Why would I have synovial fluid in my joint cavity? What do you think? It's viscous, it's slippery, so it allows the lubrication and reduce the friction exactly between those articular surfaces. I'm reducing the friction. Also, remember, cartilage is avascular. So where will it get its nutrients and oxygen from? It is gonna get its nutrients and oxygen from the bone from one side and from the synovial fluid from the other side. So it lubricates and it 
gonna it's gonna be nourishing the articular cartilage. It reduces friction and it's gonna be supplying the cartilage with the nutrients it, it needs. As the cartilage again, as you remember, it's a vascular, it doesn't have blood vessels in it. So what do you think? If I am telling you that I have a shallow space between the articulating bones, is this a type of joints is more or less stable compared to something like the sutures where the bones are fused together? It's gonna be less stable as you have a space between the articulating bones, right? So do you need more or less reinforcement to stabilize the joint? What do you think? If we're looking here at a joint with a space between the articulating bones, is this something logical that you can require more reinforcement? Yes, so I, I will definitely need more reinforcement for me to stabilize the joint for me to not have a joint dislocation. So what kind of reinforcement do I have in here? I have three ty different types of reinforcement. I have the intracapsular reinforcements, which are the ligaments attaching the bones together. Like what? Like, for example, if this is the femur, let's say, and this is my tibia, I have the anterior cruciate ligament, posterior cruciate ligament, ACL, PCL. Those are ligaments attaching the bones together to reinforce and stabilize the joints. This is something inside the joint capsule. So we call it intracapsular reinforcement. If we're looking at the knee joint, also we're gonna see other reinforcements, like for example, the quadriceps tendon that will be surrounding the patella in here. And we'll keep going down as my patellar ligament to be attached to this point. If you remember, this is my tibial tuberosity. So I'm attaching the two bones together here, but this reinforcement is outside of the joint cavity outside of the joint capsule. So we call this reinforcement. It's an extra capsular reinforcement. So you've got here ligaments attaching the two bones inside the joint space. This is my intra capsular reinforcement. I have muscles and tendons traveling from outside attaching the bones together. This is an extra capsular reinforcement. And I have the fibrous capsule on here. This fibrous capsule also gonna be attaching the two bones together. It's so dense. So it actually reinforces the joint. So we call this as a capsular reinforce. So again, again, we have three, three different types of reinforcements that we can see in the synovial joints. We have the intracapsular reinforcement and those are deep to the capsule. They are covered by the synovial membrane, like here, those ligaments attaching the bones together. We have extra capsular reinforcement, and those are going to be located outside of the joint capsule. Outside of the joint capsule. And we have the capsular or intrinsic reinforcement. This is part of the fibrous capsule 
itself that allows you to stabilize the joint. Joints are going to be rich in nerves and blood vessels. Many nerve fibers are going to be located in the joint to detect pain and to monitor the position of your joint. So if you close your eyes and you move your finger, would you be able to know what is the position of your joint or not? What do you think? If you close your eyes and you move any part of your skeleton, would you be able to figure out the position of the joint, whether it's flexed, extended, Yes or no? Yes. How do you do this? You have a lot of nerve fibers within your joints that are detecting the degree of stretch applied to the ligaments and tendons, as well as the joint capsule. And your brain will be decoding those signals to know what is the state of the joint. Is it flexed? Is it extended? And so on. So you figure out the position of your joint according to the signals detected by, by those nerve fibers detecting the degree of stretch of muscles, tendons, and ligaments. Also, the joint will be rich in blood vessels i have capillary beds which will be responsible to create this synovial fluid that fills the joint gap so again again important characteristics on here for the synovial joints i have articular surfaces covered with hyaline cartilage i have a cavity a small potential space filled with synovial fluid I have the joint capsule, which is formed of two layers, an outer fibrous capsule, and an inner synovial membrane. The space between the articulating bones is going to be filled with synovial fluid, which is going to be lubricating and nourishing the articular cartilages. As I have a space between yes it's a very small space between the articulating bones but still a space i will need to reinforce the joints in order for me to reinforce the joints i will have three types of reinforcements again those are my ligaments inside the cavity of the joint. Those are an example of intracapsular reinforcement. I have reinforcements outside of the joint cavity. This is going to be considered, those are going to be considered as extracapsular reinforcements. And I have the joint capsule itself, the fibrous capsules that will be attaching the bones together. This is a capsular Reinforcement again, your joints, your synovial joints are going to be rich in nerve fibers to detect pain and the position of the joints, as well as they are rich in capillary beds. They have a lot of blood vessels inside in order for you to form the synovial flu. Any questions? 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 All right, so moving on to the ways by which you're going to be reducing the friction between the articulating bones and the surrounding tendons and ligaments. You have 
sacs filled with synovial fluid, those are called the bursi. Those are flattened fibrous sacs lined with synovial membranes. They are filled with synovial fluid. And their main function is to reduce the friction. Like here, for example, between the head of the humerus and this ligament that attaches the acromion to the cor coracoid process. We have a sac filled with synovial fluid. This is a burst. And what is the function of the burst? So with every time you're gonna be moving your humerus, there will be some friction between the head of the humerus and this ligament. So in order for you to reduce the friction between the two, you're gonna have this bertha located in between, which is again a flattened sac filled with synovial same concept will be for the tendon sheath. So the tendon sheath is the same as the bursa, but it's just elongated to surround the tendon. So if we're looking on here, this is my tendon of the, of the biceps. I have this sac that surrounds the tendon. This sac surrounding the tendon on here. This is my tendon sheath. So again, again, what's a tendon sheath? This is simply an elongated bursa that traps the tendon. And the function again is gonna be to reduce the friction between the tendon and the surrounding bone structures when you are moving your joints. So what do you think? Are the synovial joints synarthrosis, amphiarthrosis, or diarthrotic joints? Do I have no movement of the synovial joints? Do I have slight movement or do I have high degree of mobility? I am a diarthrosis. What do you think? Synovial joints are freely movable. They are diarthrotic joints. So what kind of movements can I allow by the synovial joints? I have gliding motion, gliding movement, in which I have two flat surfaces on here. Those are two flat surfaces like this. And the movements they allow It's just a sliding motion between the two. So those two flat surfaces, what they can do is to slide over one another. This is what we call a gliding movement. Angular movement means I am changing the size of an angle and an angular movement can take place along either the sagittal plan or the frontal plan so angular movements if i'm looking here at the side this is the head of a person like this this is his ear. So if the movement is taking place along the sagittal, remember sagittal plane is the one that splits the body into right part and left part. 
So this is the angle I'm moving. I can I can either increase the angle of the joint or I can reduce the angle of the joint. This is taking place along my sagittal plane. How about taking place along the frontal plane? So this means that the movement is either going to be towards the midline or away from the midline. So this is the angle I am changing. So again, again, this is moving either towards the midline or away from the midline. And this is the angle I'm changing on here. Moving along the sagittal. Again, one more time. This is the angle I'm changing. All right, so those are all considered angular movements. So we have either gliding motion, and again, the gliding movement is taking place between flat surfaces. Angular movement might be taking place along either frontal, or sedged. Those are angular movements. Rotational movements, for example, if I'm talking about head rotation, the rotation is the movement around my own axis. So I can rotate my head to the right, I can rotate my head to the left. This is a rotational movement. It's taking place around the axis of the part that you are moving, around your own axis. This is what we call a rotational movement. And finally, we have special movements that we're going to be discussing. So first, gliding motion, like the gliding movement between your carpal bones. So whenever you are moving your hand, your fingers, touching your carpal bones, you will feel that there is a very slight movement taking place between your carpal bones. And this slight gliding motion, this sliding that is taking place between the, the carpal bones is considered a gliding movement. Gliding movement. This shallow sliding movement taking place, it's my gliding motion. Moving on to the angular movement first along my sagittal plane so if i'm looking here this is the angle of my joint please please pay attention at 
this point, it's really important to understand the movements for you to be able to understand what we're going to be discussing with the muscles. If you can't understand the movements, you won't be able to understand the muscle action. So it's very important to understand the different movement and the definition of those movements. So if I am reducing the angle of the joint, I am moving my head down like this. So the angle of the joint is going to be reduced. This is called a flexion. What if you are moving backwards? So what happened to the angle of the joint in this case? Did I increase or reduce the angle of the joint? Did I increase or decrease the angle of the joint? I increased the angle of the joint. And when I increase the angle of the joint along the sagittal plane, this is going to be an extension. Hyperextension is extension. It's extension. It's not another movement. It's the same movement. But hyperextension is just a description of an extension that is beyond the normal range of motion. So how many times do you get, you move your head backwards like this? Beyond the normal range of motion. It's something that is very rare that you are performing. Why? Because it's beyond the normal range of motion. So a hyperextension is an extension, but just a description of an extension that tells you that this is an extension just beyond the normal range of motion. So let's see other example on here. See the spine. This is the angle of the joint. When I'm moving in this direction, what's going to happen to the angle of the joint? Would I have an increase or a reduction in the angle of the joint? What do you think? Do I have an increase or a reduction in the angle of the joint? If I'm moving in this direction. Reduction. So what do you call this? If you have a reduction in the angle of the joint, is this flexion or an extension? If you reduce the angle of the joint, what do you call this? It's a flexion. What if you are moving back like this? So now this is the angle of your joint. All this. So what happens to the angle of the joint in this case? Is this an increase or a decrease in the angle of the joint? It's an increase of the joint in the angle of the joint. So this is going to be considered an extension. If I got extra extension beyond the normal range of motion, this is going to be called hyperextension. It's not again, it's not a, another movement. It's just a description of an extension. Just a description of the extension that it's beyond the normal range of motion. Looking at the shoulder joint, for example. So this is the angle of the joint. So when I move up, and this is when I move it backwards. So what happens in this case to the angle of the joint? This is my angle on here. Inflection. If I'm moving my, my arm forward, I have a reduction in the angle of the joint. So this is called flexion. 
when I'm moving my arm backwards, I'm increasing the angle of the joint. So this is going to be an extension. Let's check here the knee. The knee is what gets many of you confused. Where is the angle of the joint for the knee? The angle of the joint in the knee, it's here. Procedure. So a backward movement of the leg will do what to the angle of the joint you see on here? This is how the angle of the joint looks like. A forward movement of the leg, this is how the angle of the, of the knee joint looks like. So forward movement of the leg is an extension for the knee. And the backward movement of the leg, it's a flexion of the knee. Does this make sense? Any trouble here with the flexion extension? Any trouble with flexion extension? All right. Moving on to the angular movements along the frontal plan. We're looking here at, if I'm moving away from the midline, away from the midline, this is abduction. If I'm moving towards the midline, I'm moving towards the midline, this is an adduction so remember when you are moving your arm towards your body you're adding your arm to your body this is an adduction and if i move it away this is abduction all right so when you are adding adding you pull the arm towards your body this is an adduction if you're moving your arm away from your body this is abduction is the difference here clear between adduction and abduction so again again if i'm moving towards the midline this is add or ab add or ab if i'm moving towards the midline Anyone else? If you're moving towards the midline, what do we call this movement? Adduction. If you're moving away from the midline, this is abduction. All right, so this is not a rotational movement. Why it's not a rotational movement? Because you're not rotating around your own axis. It's not a rotation around your own axis. This movement is a combined movement. So here, if I'm looking here at my arm, what I'm doing here is called circumduction. It's not a rotational movement. Circumduction is formed of flexion, ab, extension, add. Flexion, ab, extension, add. Flexion, ab, extension, add. Flexion, ab, extension, add. All right, it's a combined movement where you're combining flexion, extension, and abduction and adduction. All right, it's a combined movement. It's not a rotational movement. Rotational movement means I am rotating my arm around its own axis. This is a rotational movement. Head around its own axis. This is a rotational movement. But circumduction is not a rotational movement. It's a combined flexion, ab, extension, at. Combined movement called circumduction. Questions, questions? <laughs> 
All right, we can have a break for 10. We come back, discuss more about the joint movements. Any questions before we go for a break? All right, we'll see you in 10.
All right, welcome back for Aliyah. We have one question only so far for the in class activity. This was the question. Right, it's asking about what type of joints do we have between the bones of the cranium, and the answer was sutures. All right, moving on to another type of movements. This is going to be the rotational movement. And again, the rotational movement is taking place around the bones on long axis. Examples of rotational movement, like the rotational movement between C1 and C2, the atlas and axis. This allows the rotation of the head from side to side rotation of the humerus and of the femur around their own axis. So I can rotate my thigh outwards or inwards. Same for the arm, it can rotate inwards or outwards. All right, so the rotational movement here is gonna be either towards the midline or away from the midline. So we're gonna call those rotational movements either a lateral rotation or a medial rotation. This would be applied for, this would be applicable for the rotation of the humerus or the arm and the rotation of the femur or the thigh. Inward, Rotation, it's a media rotation. Outward rotation is a lateral rotation. Special movements, I have the rotational movement of the radius, but not around its own axis, it's around the ulna. This allows you to turn your hand forward and backwards. This is called pronation and supination pronation and supination pronation supination pronation supination special movement of the foot an upward movement of the foot it's called dorsiflexion a downward movement of the foot, it's a plantar flexion. So remember, plants, plants are attached to the ground. So if you're moving your foot towards the ground, it's plantar flexion. If you're moving your foot towards your back, it's a dorsiflexion. Dorsi, dorso, dorso means back. So a backward movement, or an upward movement of the foot, it's a dorsiflexion, a downward movement of the foot, where you go towards the ground, this is gonna be a plantar flexion. Also in the foot, if I create a space between my foot, if this is my foot like this, I create the space between the foot and the ground towards the midline, so I have the space on the in, in, in side, this is, in 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 version. If I created the space between my foot and the ground on the outside, this is gonna be an e version. So again, again, space between your foot and the ground on the inside towards your midline. This is an inversion if you create the space between your foot and the ground away from the midline outside this is going to be an e version so you've got e version the space in is inside towards the midline and e version the space was to the outside it's e version special movement of the mandible, a forward movement of the mandible. 
this is protraction a backward movement of the mandible this is a retraction forward movement protraction backward movement of the mandible this is a retraction when you open your mouth dropping your mandible this is going to be depression of the mandible if you close your mouth an upward movement of the mandible this is an elevation of the mandible so something just to remind you of the of the terms that we use to describe the movement so when do you open your mouth when do you open your mouth to do what to speak or to eat right and when do you eat the most? When do you eat the most? When you are stressed. When you are depressed. All right. So you eat the most when you are depressed. So remember when you are depressed. You're not the only one who's depressed. Your mandible also is depressed. All right. Just to remind you, what do we call the downward movement of the mandible? What do we call it? Depression of the mandible. An upward movement of the mandible, it's elevation of the mandible. All right. This makes sense. Makes sense. So again, again, an up a downward movement of the mandible is depression of the mandible. An upward movement of the mandible is elevation of the mandible. Special movement of the thumb. So the thumb is the only finger that can face the other four medial fingers. So like counting your fingers on here your thumb has the ability to move and face the other four fingers so this is called opposition so the thumb opposes the rest of the fingers it's called opposition We classify the synovial joints according to the shape of their articular surfaces. First type of synovial joints, I have two flat surfaces articulating together. Those two flat surfaces articulating together are gonna form what we call a plane joint. Plane joint allows just a gliding motion. No angular movement is going to be taking place in here. So we classify this joint as a non-axial joint. I don't move neither along sagittal axis or the frontal axis or around my own axis. It's a char, just a short gliding motion that is allowed by the plane joints. An example here of the plane joints is going to be the joints between those carpal bones where I have flat surfaces articulating against one another. Hinge joint in which I have a cylindrical shaped surface which is convex that articulates with a concave surface like the articulation between the trochlea of the humerus and the trochlear notch of the ulna so the articulation between the two in here i have one is a cylinder and the other one is a cavity where the cylinder fits so we call this joint it's a hinge joint how many axes can i perform movement along what what movements can you perform on here between 
the humerus and the ulna, the troplea and the troplear notch. What movements? You can only perform flexion and extension. So how many axes I'm moving along? It's an angular movement, but this movement is along how many axes? Just one axis, which is the sagittal plane or sagittal axis. So we classify the hinge joints as uniaxial joints. The movement they allow is taking place along a single axis. Another type of synovial joints in which I have a rounded surface that articulates with a sleeve from another bone, like the articulation here between the radius and the ulna. This allows one movement to take place, which is the rotation of the radius around the ulna. Can you remind me what is the movement? What do we call those, this movement that will be taking place in the hand due to the rotational movement of the radius around the ulna? What do we call this movement? Can you remind me? Pronation and supination, exactly. Pronation and supination. So a pivot joint, I have a rounded end that articulates with a ring or a sleeve from another bone. It's taking place around one axis, which is the axis of my ulna. So it's gonna be classified as a uni axial joint uni axial joint i have only one axis along which i would be performing my move moving on to the condyloid joint and the condyloid joints i have one convex surface that will articulate with one concave surface like this like the articulation between the phalanx and the metacarpal bone. So what movement can I perform? I can perform flexion extension. Flexion extension. If this is my metacarpal bone like this, and this is my proximal phalanx, I can perform flexion. Reducing the angle of the joint. Or I can perform extension. Increasing the angle of the joint. What else can I perform? I can move my finger away or towards my midline. So if I am, this is a side view. If I'm looking at an interior view on here, this is my metacarpal bone. And this is my proximal phalanx like this. So the proximal or the finger can move towards the midline. This is adduction. And it can move away from the midline. This is abduction. So here I can move along sagittal flexion extension and along frontal performing abduction and adduction. 
So how many axes can I move along as a condyloid or ellipsoid joint? How many axes can I move along? I can perform flexion, extension, abduction, and adduction. How many axes I can move along? I can move along two axes. So we classify this joint as a biaxial joint. It's a biaxial joint. Moving on to another type of synovial joints. This is going to be the saddle joint in which I have two articular surfaces. Each of them has a concave part and the convex part. I have concave part and the convex part. This is like the articulation here between the carpal bone and the first metacarpal bone of the thumb. This articulation here, I have each of the two articular surfaces have concave parts and convex parts. We call this is a saddle joint, saddle joint. And the presence of the saddle joints is what allowed the thumb opposition. It allowed a greater freedom of movement than the condyloid joints, and that's why the thumb can perform opposition, but not any of the other four fingers. The type of synovial joints that provides you with the widest range of motion is going to be the ball and socket. And we have two famous examples here of the ball and socket joints. First one is the articulation between the head of the femur and the acetabulum. So the head of the femur here is going to be the ball and the socket is going to be the acetabulum. And the other example is going to be the head of the humerus and the glenoid cavity of the scapula. Those are the two examples of wall and socket joints. And this allows the widest range of motion. I can perform flexion, extension. I can perform abduction, adduction. I can perform rotation. So I have more than two axes that I can move along. That's why we classify the ball and socket joints as multi-axial joints. I have more than two axes that I can move along. That's why we call those are multi-axial joints. Right? Questions, questions. All right, so for the in-class activity for today, please mention whether the joint is going to be uniaxial, biaxial, or multiaxial. And starting from question number two, because we're done with question number one already, we have plane joint, hinge, pivot, condyloid, 
saddle and finally ball and sock. All right, so just mention, just mention the, whether the type of synovial joint is a uniaxial joint, a biaxial joint, a non-axial joint was one of the options as well, non-axial. For each of those six different types of synovial joints. All right, so this completes our discussion for today. Next class, we're going to be completing the rest of chapter eight. We have a small part that's still remaining. Expect the uh, lab exam to be available for you one week before the new extended due date. So it's going to be the new due date it's going to be July 16, so expect it to be available for you one week before the day on July 10th. So on July 10 or early July 10, you're gonna have the lab exam two available. And again, it's gonna be a proctored exam. So you need to access it through smarter proctoring. It's not available yet. It's going to be available for you to complete just one week before this due date.